This video is brought to you by Viking Jewelry. Hey! Today we are exploring an era that we usually don't talk about much on this channel, the Stone Age, so before metal became the main material for tools, hunting and weapons. In order to be useful to create axes, arrowheads, spearheads, a stone needs to be able to have an edge. You need to be able to make it sharp and not all stones are suitable for that. For example, this one is not very... no. I mean, you can still... but... nah. If you're an avid gamer like I am and you have played survival games such as Valheim or Conan, there is one stone that you know can be used to make that sort of implements, and that is flint. In these video games, flint usually appears white or very light grey, is found near rivers and is used to make the very first kits, including tools, weapons, hand axes, spearheads, arrowheads and whatnot. And that's actually quite realistic. Usually I'd say historically accurate, but in this case I should probably say prehistorically accurate. Flint is a type of chert, which is a cryptocrystalline or polycrystalline quartz that usually forms as nodules in limestone. It varies in colour, it can go from grey to black and nearly opaque, because of included carbonaceous matter. Opaque, dull, whitish to pale brown or grey specimens are simply called chert. The physical properties are those of quartz. There are a few reasons why I've decided to talk about this and look at that beautiful cortex. The Stone Age is huge. It lasted approximately 3.4 million years. Take a moment to process that. So even though we tend to like to sort of focus on iron tools and these kind of technology, in reality, humanity, mankind as a whole, has been using Stone Age technology a lot longer than it has metal. In fact, it is the melting and smelting of copper that marks the end of the Stone Age. The Stone Age is divided in the Paleolithic, Mesolithic and Neolithic periods. The Neolithic begins with the advent of agriculture, which drastically changed the way of living of the prehistorical man. So today we will mostly focus on Paleolithic and Mesolithic working techniques. At this time, men were hunter-gatherers. Some suggest that scavenging was an important pattern of subsistence behaviour in the Lower and Middle Paleolithic of Europe and in the late African Middle Stone Age, although evidence suggests a very early start of hunting as a major way to procure food. In this respect, Neanderthal and earlier humans in Europe did not differ from Upper Paleolithic or modern human. Neanderthals hunted a wide range of prey. We could safely say that quarrying and manufacture of flint is probably humankind's first business venture. The art of working flint is called napping and there are books and plenty of videos about it and I will leave links in the description. Today I will try to nap flint for the first time in my life as a prehistorical man. What I'm doing here is in fact experimental archaeology. I want to recreate the very first time a prehistorical man experimented with flint napping. We will try to assess how difficult it is to transfer my idea of a certain shape into the rock. Flint napping is a real skill that needs to be learned over years of practice. On to the kit now. Here we have a collection of English flint and American chert and flint. Then I have these cobbles or round river stones that are going to act as my hammer stone used to strike off lithic flakes from a lump of tool stone during the process of lithic reduction. The hammer stone is a rather universal stone tool which I appeared early in most regions of the world. A hammer stone is made of a material such as sandstone, limestone or quartzite, and it is often ovoid in shape. In our day and age, flint nappers are using copper hammers, but I'm using deer antlers because I want to be as close as possible to the prehistorical man. Deer antlers are not horns, so male deers or bucks shed them. Early antlers are bones made of calcium and phosphorus. These tissues grow extremely fast, sometimes even a quarter of an inch a day. They are the product of excess nutrition, so well-nourished deer will have bigger antlers. So you can easily pick some up from the local forest if there are deers there. Today we're going to try all of this together and I'll tell you more about the science, the history and the physics involved after a quick word from a deer sponsor. Now, the dear sponsor for this video is Viking Jewelry, and the reason why I call them like that is because they've been sponsoring this channel for quite a few years now, and they really sent so many things, and I'm very appreciative, and I'm very thankful for all the good rings, like this bronze ring, silver ring, but also for the line of clothing, which is sort of a recent upgrade that they have had, like this beautiful t-shirt that you can see here. You'll find all of this on their website, but today, is the day for you because there is a 25% off for first line products for the next 48 hours. So definitely go check them out right now 
don't miss out. Also, if you've always liked the Veg Vizier Pendant Ronic, then that one already has a 25% off, which means that if you use my code, you will get a 50% off. That's half price. So huge thanks to Viking Jewelry for sponsoring this video. Absolutely amazing, guys. Very trustworthy and very nice shop. Check them out. Link in the description. Alright, let's talk about safety now because one thing that many people don't know is that flint can get sharper than steel. Now, of course, a steel blade advantage is the fact that it's it's not going to wear down as easily, it's going to be more durable. But if you happen to work with obsidian, which could be part two of this series if you like this video, then you can get a blade so sharp that if you put it under a microscope, you could actually see that you will be able to cut single cells. So with that in mind, heavy duty gloves, safety glasses, you definitely don't want a small fragment to fly into your eye, padding for the knee where you're going to put your stone when you're working. Usually people use leather paddings, but in this case I didn't have one, so I just freaking put a little bit of armor and then, and whatever I could find. Very important is that you need to have a way to collect all the different fragments or debitage as they are called for a few reasons. First of all, these small fragments are still extremely sharp, so they could easily cut through the sole of a shoe. And of course, if any animal comes and starts messing with them, they will cut themselves and they could puzzle future archaeologists because, I mean, there is no way to distinguish a Paleolithic worked stone and the stone worked by a modern Napa. So let's be responsible about this. And another thing that is important to have is a mask or some sort of respirator because as you work flint, it will create micro dust that can mess with your lungs. In fact, historical and prehistorical flint Nappas commonly suffered from silicosis due to the inhalation of the stuff. Probably humanity's first case of industrial disease, I suppose, which is also why I'm doing this outside rather than inside. What we want to do now is reducing the flint into a workable size called quartering. One thing that I'm noticing as I'm working with flint for the first time is that it very much resembles glass. Not only in the way it sounds, but also in the way it chips. In fact, if you've ever chipped glass, you have generated what is called a conchoidal fracture, which is what we're trying to achieve here. Hard percussion is the first to appear and the only one known for at least two million years. The very first kind of stone implements were most likely naturally fractured stones, which then led men to try and cause these basic fractures themselves. And with time, a single flake fracture stone was developed into a multi-fractured stone. Then something happens and men who have been doing this for generations and generations start to refine their art, introducing their soft armor, usually made of wood or deer antlers, that will allow the primitive man to calibrate the attack of percussion planes inaccessible to the hard armor, apply pressure flaking to create a finer serrated edge and prepare percussion platforms in certain nuclei. These finer examples are usually closely associated with the Mesolithic, typically smaller lithic tools and weapons when compared to the heavy chipped equivalents typical of the Paleolithic. Flint is created by the deposit of biogenic silica. You can envision it as a sort of supersaturation which will precipitate at the oxic anoxic boundary, about 10 meters down. As sea life dies, it drops to the undersea surface and rottens away, leaving behind the remnants that will become 98% pure calcium carbonate, basically pure white chalk. And over the eons, the flint nodules will form a crust that is called cortex. In other words, the formation of flint is in a stratum and it's also full of animal and plant debris. One thing that you will notice is that when I do manage to get a flake off, again not an easy thing to do when you don't know what you're doing like me, it makes a different kind of noise. That's the shockwave passing through the flint which is traveling at several thousand feet a second. It radiates in the shape of a cone and that's something important to have in mind as you try and achieve the flaking. Goodness gracious, this is hard. One thing that I'm noticing immediately is that the cortex tends to absorb quite a a lot of horse so that's actually difficult if you hit that directly it's not easy to remove and so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to remove it by hitting the other side uh, whenever you watch people who are proficient and I know that Scalagrim has got quite a few videos where he showed what he can do that it's quite impressive and now people who know how to do this make it look simple Believe me, it's not. But I do want to spend a word or two onto the weapons themselves and the shapes and why I believe they chose certain shapes. Of course, the reason why we are trying to remove material from the stone is because you don't want to have too much stuff, otherwise it's going to be unwieldy. So you want to turn it into something relatively thinner. I wouldn't say thin because, I mean, you can't really call them thin, but definitely 
thinner and that you can easily mount on top of a shaft. With arrows, there is aerodynamics. You need a certain shape for the arrow to function. Usually you use sinew to sort of wrap it around the shaft. Uh, you also use pine resin or rosin as some people call it. They're actually different. I was going to use some pine resin, but then I decided not to because apparently if you cook it, which you need to in order to make, to turn it into a liquid, because normally when you buy it, it's solid, it can be toxic. So I decided, you know, I haven't had enough time to do some proper research on how to do it safely. So I'm not going to do that part. And besides, it's going to take me time to, before I can get to the point where I have something that I can finally use and mount it on something. Spears are absolutely fascinating to me in this period. The first question I would ask, are these throwing spears or are these hand spears? Well, it has been suggested by, I believe, Church Hill that Neanderthals used thrusting rather than throwing spears by placing a prey in a disadvantaged position, for example, in a pit because of a trap, and then killing it at close quarters. And that, that makes sense. But I also think that sometimes I believe some historians who have never really tried to use a weapon might underestimate the effectiveness or even the effective range of a throwing spear. In fact, I was reading a book by Churchill where he was talking about the ethnographic sources that indicating that the range of throwing spears would be of about eight meters. And since they say that that's probably dangerously close to very big animals such as a mammoth. But I'm not sure I agree with that because if you think about it, when you look at the Roman javelin, the pilum, the maximum range of a pilum was in order of 30 meters. Although sure, maybe it's a most effective range would be 15, but still eight meters sound too short, particularly for like Neanderthal men who would have been particularly strong. Now, of course, the world record for throwing javelins in summer Olympics is like 98 meters. It's almost 100 meters for a male athlete. Olympic javelins weigh less. They are just a different kind of throwing implement specifically designed to optimize that. It's not designed to kill. I want to say we don't know. They could have been used for both. It could have been used for throwing and they could have been used for hand to hand. And I think I'm going to continue. I mean, today we are probably not going to be able to make anything. I mean, that's that's the best I could do. You know, I just started and I think uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to keep on doing this a little bit every day and then I'll get back to you and see if I can manage to make a spearhead. And that's it for the experiment for today. I learned a lot and I have to say that I'm particularly impressed now with Stone Age technology. You might think it's simple and it is not. But if you like this video, I could turn it into a series. Maybe keep on trying, seeing if I can make more objects. We could see uh, different varieties around the world and most importantly, I could make a dedicated video onto obsidian and all of its relative weapons. But let me know in the comments below and make sure you don't forget to check out Viking Jewelry through the link in the description. Thank you very much for watching and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.